Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to yet another session of School Synergy Workshop Series. Uh, so you all know, perhaps, that we have been uh, having this School Synergy Workshop Series uh, from a long time, two years now. And uh, the sessions are focused on uh, the practices that teachers can adopt in the classrooms. And the attempt is made to bridge the gap between the teacher education centers and the schools. And uh, we can discuss topics which can be directly implemented by teachers in the classroom or uh, allow teachers to uh, you know, share their experiences and build on their experiences, even design certain activities that they can uh, do in the classroom. So these uh, workshop series, we generally, we have two parts. Uh, so today is the first part of this uh, session. In the first part of the session, we have the facilitators uh, who uh, talk uh, about a particular topic, uh, interact with the teachers. And in the second part of the session, which uh, happens on the next Saturday, uh, the teachers are expected to share their experience on that particular topic and even to, uh, you know, design uh, something and uh, 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 design any activity which they can di directly implement in the uh, classrooms and uh, you know share that uh, their own experiences about that so uh, it has been a very very interesting experience for last two years engaging with uh, all the teachers uh, many teachers joined for the first part of the session and um, few join for the second part also but we want you all to you know to feel uh, empowered and encouraged to join the second part of the session also where the teachers are expected to design and share their experience because we see teachers as uh, designers and they can design the content that they want to uh, actually implement in the classroom today's session is again a very special one by my colleague anusha ramanathan and uh, she is going to discuss the uh, taxonomies and how they can be connected uh, you know the learning can be connected with nep itself anusha and i have worked uh, together for a long time and also on many projects including connected learning initiative uh, uh, we both have been in this center for excellence in teacher education for last six years and uh, anusha also is now uh, handling uh, the language education uh, in our center taking several courses on that and is also uh, uh, handling uh, the clicks 2.0 in uh, which is occurring in several states including uh, telangana and uh, chhattisgarh and uh, there is there is lots to uh, <laughs> tell about that, but uh, I think I will give the floor to Anusha to, uh, you know, introduce her topic and also, uh, you know, take all of us through this journey of understanding uh, these NEP and the taxonomies itself. Yeah, go ahead, Anusha. Thank you um, for a very generous introduction, <clears throat> So I'm going to uh, try and, uh, you know, work my way through this. I am sure you have a lot of ideas, which is why one of the uh, points in it is discussions around examples. And we really hope, as Ruchi pointed out, uh, not that hope, we trust that uh, you have more capabilities and you are definitely willing to share your own concerns experiences, suggestions in handling these, uh, you know, um, NEP guidelines and what we are currently looking at. Not much of this is very new. Uh, all that is being asked for is perhaps a little bit of um, wording it in a way, organizing information in a way that is slightly more conducive to how policy is being mandated right now. So um, that's being said, I, uh, as pointed out, it is more a discussion-based class, uh, uh, a session, not a class. I'm sorry, this is the teacher in me which uses the word class all the time. But um, 
a session in terms of interaction and I look forward to your comments and suggestions and I hope to learn from you as much as uh, share what I know, right? So um, in a lot of ways, what we are looking through in terms of taxonomies of learning is um, definitely when we talk about understanding taxonomies, there are many, uh, which is the most famous one or which are the ones that you know of, if you can, uh, also, uh, you know, type in the chat or unmute yourself and speak, it will be great. I'll also take you to all these resources. There are many resources available. Uh, there are also uh, quite a few rubric makers and other kinds of assess assessment tools that are available that had been done in another session. So I'm not going to go to them. But yes, Bloom's uh, taxonomy is definitely one of the more popular ones. And uh, thank you, Manitra. Yeah. Yes. Breathholds taxonomy yes. is also there. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. There are. Mm. And Vinita, thank you. Again, you have also pointed out multiple intelligence and uh, others. So as pointed out, there's not one taxonomy per se that you would have. You would have multiple taxonomies. And I plan to share the resources directly because that's available and you may be able to use them and use these kinds of objectives also in your own teaching. Some of this is absolutely uh, you know, open source and Creative Commons licensed. So um, one thing that you could be looking through is the fact that most of the time when we are thinking about taxonomies of learning, we generally think about what we want to assess towards the end in traditional methods, we, that's how we are looking at. Of course, when we are looking at teaching to test, we first figure out what is going to be there in the test and then try and see whether we can teach them to ace that test. But a lot of the principles in a sense that comes in, thank you, Vinita, uh, where you're looking at teaching, learning, uh, assessments, methodologies, yes, absolutely. So you could be looking through in terms of how you're trying to create the content, plan assignments, determine grading, and then finally perhaps look at it and see whether they translate into objectives or not. However, uh, most of the elements that you're looking at when you focus on understanding by design would be that ideally we should be leading towards uh, identifying desired results, determining acceptable evidence, and then planning learning experiences that we will be looking at what is acceptable evidence. And this is one of the reasons why, um, yeah, I, I will definitely, that's an interesting question and we should uh, definitely look at it in terms of Bloom's or Gardiner's taxonomies. In fact, that was one of the questions that I did have uh, to post to the group. Uh, so in terms of it, when we are looking through these universal design principles, it could be that you're looking through, and I'm, you already had a session, so I'm just going to very quickly recap, but the fact that there must be engagement, there must be representation where they are able to understand and perceive in different ways that they are able to, it could include language, it would include comprehension levels in terms of multimedia, how we are able to push it. And then of course, how they are able to express, maybe they could use artwork, some of them could use speaking, some of them could do actions and modeling. So how is it that we are enabling them to express what they know uh, to that extent? So this becomes an interesting element of uh, looking at how we could uh, gauge the going back to this topic, which is determining acceptable evidence. What is it that for us is acceptable evidence? And we've been having these discussions even at higher education level as much as in school education level. Uh, and it is basically to try and see what is acceptable uh, if, if we're talking about participation in the classroom, what is acceptable participation in the classroom? You know, is it about nodding your head? Is it about typing into the chat? Is it about being present, just being present? Is it about being, uh, you know, punctual, on-time submissions? What is good participation? And these kinds of questions and doubts and ideas are things that we are generally grappling with in terms of trying to understand how do we decode them and how do we 
um, grade them to that extent. And we come back to NEP for that reason. So when we are dealing with it. Now to go back, um, some of you are very aware of the different taxonomies of learning. So I'm, I'm just going to try and uh, quickly recap the some of these. And I hope that we'll have more discussions on what you have as challenges. So um, definitely we look at the Bloom's taxonomy, which almost everyone keeps referring to. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy is an older one. It was revised by Anderson and Crothall, but we still refer to that taxonomy as Bloom's taxonomy. And largely we are looking at it in terms of whether there is factual knowledge or conceptual knowledge procedural knowledge, what kind of metacognitive knowledge can we look at? But uh, Bloom's taxonomy to a large extent really focuses on psychomotor skills that you have, the understanding, application, et cetera. Now, the reason why we are focusing on these is if you say, take up something like Fink's taxonomy, this is another taxonomy that I didn't hear uh, being spoken about. So I may spend a bit more time here on this. But uh, there is in Fink's taxonomy, these elements that he talks about, right? Where he says that there could be foundational knowledge, there could be application that comes in, there is integration, there is a human dimension, and there is caring, and there is learning how to learn. Now, my question to you is, this sounds very fancy, uh, this sounds very nice, but how do we then, bring about learning through these elements where we look at you know the caring or if you say what is human dimension it is learning about oneself and others or if you ask me what is caring it basically how Fink describes it is developing new feelings interests and values so he uh, talks about it in that manner this is just a simple definition how would you then be able to integrate this in a learning classroom if we look at Fink? One of the lesser uh, things, it's not that he's not known at all, but not often quoted. Gardiner multiple intelligence is definitely you know, used a lot. So uh, how do we use this? This is what your Bloom's taxonomy to a large extent will focus on. Uh, you know, remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and finally create. And uh, you could, by action verbs that you could look at is list, describe, tabulate, appropriate, use could be explained. In understanding, there could be summarizing, interpreting, predicting, executing, etc. cetera. So uh, how would you do this with the blooms, uh, with the taxonomy in terms of, yes, include, gut and emotions too. Um, would you want to uh, explain that, Ajit, in terms of when you say gut, uh, what do you mean uh, by the word gut? Um, uh, I mean gut feelings, at times intuitions. Uh, uh, okay, know, intuitive feelings. In learning would learning uh, and would education constantly look at in intuitive feelings only as in would that be a learning objective uh, it hasn't yet been happening in uh, in the case of humans but definitely uh, probably like animals we also have that capabilities of you know probably um, you know fine tuning our intuitions mm -hmm. so in our developmental stage probably in the human developmental stage that has been discounted somewhere where we are not probably giving that weightage to intuition but i feel like uh, it is a different dimension probably we haven't yet you know uh, addressed uh, if okay you see the, uh, kids learning learning in terms of uh, you know uh, maybe in a very early stage they mm -hmm. uses gut quite a lot intuitions quite a lot in their learning uh, in their early phases mm -hmm. but then because of the cultural tuning societal uh, you know intrusion they may in in the process of uh, you know development they may actually um, they may not feed that intuitions or that particular intelligence much which might be affecting uh, their learning in one way or other probably okay my three you have raised your hand thank you ajit uh, my three you've raised your hand would you have a uh, perspective yeah. to share 
Yes, yeah. I would just like to actually add on what he's saying. So if we, if if just for the sake of uh, conversation and discussion, if we look at gut and intuition as something that we very often teach in a science classroom, which is something which is up and coming, especially in the Cambridge curriculums, which is scientific thinking or scientific mindset. Also, mm-hmm. with the advent of digital technologies, there is a lot of focus on critical thinking. Mm-hmm. So I think, in my opinion, or at least uh, I, I might not. I, I know that at one point you said, "How would you make it a learning objective?" It might not be a learning objective because I know, and my Lord knows that you know, I've struggled with making critical thinking a learning objective. But it is definitely a very good path to arrive at a learning objective. So mm-hmm. when you say intuitive thinking, or even in an English class, when I'm teaching my kids, I want them to sort of. use cause and effect and use that kind of flow of thinking to arrive at an understanding or if you're looking at a word and you try and attach emotions or when you're teaching emotions or metaphors and things like that so i think that kind of ties into what he was talking about uh, in in sense of intuitive learning and yeah definitely i mean i also wanted to add on how montessori early education also looks at intuitive learning like you know let them make mistakes show them how to manage mistakes is also a way of sort of bringing in that human uh dimension uh it, yeah that that was my piece okay thank you my three thank you uh yeah if anyone else has any comments you're welcome to chime in uh it interesting yes yes go ahead rani yes go ahead i uh, i also agree with others that intuitive learning needs to be a part of part form or as early as possible Uh, as being a computer instructor or teaching a subject in computer, when we have to teach them with the uh, to make them any slides or make them any uh, ask them to write a passage that what is happening around you, always I tell them to write in the conclusion what do you what did you feel when that happened. Hmm. So as they said, cause and effect, and we need to teach our children that you please uh, focus even on your feelings when things are happening around you. That is a sign to you. Hmm. Okay. so this need yeah this need as a class teacher as a subject teacher wherever it possible we need to do that in the class on daily basis so i have a question thank you, thank you for bringing this in and i think some of you also mentioned the fact that this is also there in the language classroom um when we talk about uh thank you dr jayraman uh, as as uh, you know scientific analysis in terms of it so i'm going to go back to this point um say someone feels angry right and and i'm going back to this point that you all brought in or i think all the three of you said feelings at some point or the other and a native way of understanding concepts and constructs which is um as pointed out by ajit in the beginning children definitely do it a lot in the beginning and then over a period of time they kind of uh, reduce the dependency on that kind of native uh, intuitive knowledge native intelligence uh, all the time and and they focus a little bit more on um analysis that is more construed as academic rigor with academic rigor and there's a reason i'm asking you this question um a student says that i read this story and i felt angry i felt angry for the hero i felt angry on behalf of the hero now that is an intuitive understanding of their feeling and they're able to articulate it which is great would the learning stop there when you ask them to articulate how they feel and why they felt it would your learning stop there that is my question would would your classroom teaching stop there let me rephrase that would your classroom teaching stop there no no what would you do then uh, i think arpana we have not heard from you so arpana will ask you and then we'll go back to the jeep yeah Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I think you have uh, partly answered my question. I wanted to ask if we teach our children to uh, kind of uh, depend on their feelings and intuitions, then I feel that feelings and intuitions they change. Time it depends on the our emotions, and it is also influenced by many other factors. So I want to know actually how when others said that 
we can you know translate them or see how we can translate them into learning objective i would like to know how we can do so because um, i'm a mother and i teach my child not to depend on feelings and you know it <laughs> changes from time and again today he, i give him a chocolate i show him an ice cream and i tell him to learn this and he's happy just because i gave him I, he has something to look forward to so that is what he's feeling at that moment but then i don't know how i would um, uh, make this a learning objective in class i would want you to know that okay all right uh, i'll know sure there are uh, several uh, hands <laughs> raised actually yeah. yes i saw uh so we won't maybe not have a chance for everyone but vinita go ahead and then we will uh maybe come back to this question and look at it maitri and maitri had already had a chance so vinita go ahead yeah vinita you had a point someone also people have also lowered their hands in the meantime <laughs> okay all right so just to go back to this entire element is i think somewhere most of us in our classrooms will look at the fact that okay you're feeling angry then how would you respond what will your uh, you know what will your answer be you will also ask them to analyze how they feel look at it and say that someone will say i want to slap the other person you know this hero was so good and the villain was so bad and i want to beat up the villain and then we also have this other objective which comes in which is talking about empathy where we are also trying to teach them how to be tolerant how to be non violent there could be multiple other objectives in that classroom and so when we are talking about the gut feeling or the intuitive first response that they have maybe to the story we'll also perhaps be building on them to be able to analyze but will slapping this person or hitting this person solve the point don't be oh sorry sorry vinita all right um, i'm not the host so i i will uh, leave that aside but one of the questions that what dr jayram was also talking about is that the intuitive feeling will then have to be rationalized isn't it and please do come in dr jayram if um, you are Uh, you know if if you had some other point to make as well but the intuitive feeling is definitely to be recognized to be articulated and then what do we do beyond it and why we should do beyond it is also a part of the classroom teaching instruction um also one other element that comes in is this instinctive and this is another thing instinct versus intuition versus this rationalized thought because there is an instinct that we have where we sometimes will look at some food which is you know black in color and we like grow yuck gross um so many children actually react to beetroot like this you know when beetroot is cooked it is quite dark in color and if you had added haldi by any chance to any of this red cabbage etc it can turn black in color and so those kinds of elements where they look at it and say yuck what color it's like charred food and then you say no but it might be tasty to look at and maybe you should overcome your instinct and actually verify whether what you're saying is yucky is actually factually correct and so this is the point where you are trying to build in their scientific thinking process where you're asking them to verify to test their hypothesis to experiment to learn from it and to perhaps overcome their instinctive response one of the instinctive responses we have is to flee from danger but then when we go on trekking when we go and see a big as you know if you go on treks or bird watching and suddenly a large monkey uh, not an orangutan or something comes and comes near you the while we may be trying to you know run away the best thing really that the trek guides tell you is to stand absolutely still like a statue and uh, that would be the aspect of where you're looking at instinct to flee versus the right approach to look at now why am i talking of all of this is somewhere in our learning objectives uh, and our learning processes this is what education will have to get us to do to recognize where intuition might work but also recognize that intuition is very 
as um, you know, one of uh, Arpana was saying, that it may change from time to time. It will depend on a lot of circumstances. It will depend on experience. If you've never had an experience to look at fire and learn to fear it, then you will always be attracted to the fire and touch and go near it. So in many African cultures, to train this child to learn to fear the fire, the mother actually allows the child to go near the campfire, uh, or I'm saying campfire, but near the fire where it is cooking and get slightly burnt because then the child recognizes, hey, this is not a safe space to be in and learns how to overcome uh, to overcome its attraction towards that fire and be mesmerized by it and try and go near it and catch it. I think we have seen this with children when they are looking at candle flame, et cetera. So there may be an instinctive or intuitive way of wanting to do something, which may, we may have to overcome uh, in for the real world functioning to occur in that sense. So these are uh, elements that come in <clears throat> where you, you will have to think about the fact of, you know, how far would intuition really be something that we are hoping for in the classroom? And, and I think some of you said that we should bring it in the classroom. And uh, especially when it comes to feelings, uh, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, talk right now where we say that, you know, what is your intuitive feeling? State that. But the intuitive feeling is not stopping at that intuitive feeling. In any psychology sessions also, they will say, okay, what was your first reaction? You know, and state that, articulate it, accept it, recognize it. But then again, that's not where the process stops. The process goes ahead and we would want them to understand, but what was your first, re when you felt angry, what did you want to do? And maybe they want to hit someone or they want to hurt themselves. Uh, and in social emotional learning, we constantly look at it and say, OK, but is it going to solve the problem? And then that's a kind of rational approach where slowly we try and bring in rationalism into this intuition aspect. Again, these are opinions. And you're welcome to please come back with a counterpoint, uh, definitely. But Vinita, I think now you are able to unmute yourself. So if you had a point, please go ahead and speak. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Right. Um, Vinita, do you want to or come in? I. Yeah. Oh, you're still unable to do so. All right. Surprising. Okay. Vinita, it uh, has to be some technical issue because others are able to unmute themselves. Unmute, yeah, yeah, I yeah. think so. Maybe just disconnecting the audio and reconnecting myself, but yes. Yes, that may help. Uh, Anusha, yeah. please go on. Yeah, Yeah, I will. And so one of these elements that you're looking through, yes, so Ajit, you're right. Uh, emotions and intuitions are definitely different domains. And um, one of the other aspects of intuition is also the fact that intuition may may not be the absolute right one in a sense so you may uh, have to think about whether intuition is really the learning objective and i am looking at it from also the angle that from the nep if you read through the document you will not find intuition as being prominently placed in the nep so again that's another question that you may want to consider and say why does the nep talk about uh, unique capabilities of the learner, but they are talking about flexibility, multidisciplinarity, conceptual understanding, creativity, and critical thinking, as was pointed out by Maitri uh, and Arpana, and then the ethics and constitutional values that they're looking at, multilingualism, assessment, extensive use of technology, all of these are spec uh, specified, but not really intuition. And so scientific thinking has been specifically mentioned, but not intuition. So yes, thank you, Vinita. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Ma'am, yeah. uh, the question which was like earlier stated by you about uh, this thing, uh, intuition and all that thing. Uh, being a primary teacher or educator and only focusing on pre-primary and primary years, the foundation years. And I agree with one of the parents who said, I, I would say that 
when we are doing all these kind of teaching uh, practices or with the with the younger ones the pre primary and the primary one and uh, we are making the parents involved in the process we are making them aware that if your child is not able to even speak in front of the whole audience in the classroom and the mm-hmm. child is reciprocating his his or her feelings through uh through not talking to the teacher but uh, giving the answers or giving the nod or gi- uh, giving his participation through any mode but in front of the par- either of the parent then that is also i feel that i used to uh, when uh just even before when the uh, in schools in cbsc schools uh this uh, cc pattern was there uh, the assessment process i always used to uh, have the discussions with my head of the school or as a as a overall school coordinator i worked there in two schools so i used to put across my points that yes we can assess the child from that point of also because the child will take time and when we are talking about the primary foundation years that is the important process, that is the important level when the child is actually understanding the feelings about each and every character when we are when i am teaching right now currently online and it's not offline i ensure that my kids whether the kids are of kindergarten or whether the child is of grade 1 or 3 also or four expresses what he or she felt after that activity what he or she understood the things uh, what, uh, what whether it was a good activity whether they la- loved it or they didn't uh, they were very uh, like uh, they were they were showing their angriness so i involve my parents to be a part of that thing uh, in the online uh, oh, platform right now in when i'm teaching so that's the reason the parents see that how the teacher is doing the things and how they will be doing because i feel that the parents are the first teachers for the kids only so i i take my whole all the pillars of the education into account uh, talking uh, when the child is talking to the peer or the sibling also so my uh, i took my uh, like uh, I think you're doing the, a holistic uh, uh, assessment i take the, uh, the bloom's tale and uh, multiple intelligence but i take into account the mixture of everything so i agree with you also and i agree with that parent also <laughs> so yes so that critical thinking comes in the child from the foundation level i feel you said now that uh, uh, after a period of time the child withdraws these things then they they are not uh, into it they don't follow the whole system that why we are, have to give a conclusion or why we have to give a reason to uh, every everything we are being asked in the activity so I, it's my my point of view i wanted to put across this thing so i saw this thing this was a good platform uh, the pandemic period was also good that we changed everything into off uh, o- from offline to online so everything it 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 gets attuned with the environment it you uh, getting my point that way yeah What thank I you vinita ma'am yeah uh, vinita yeah, thanks, thanks a, lot. a lot i just want to uh, point out thank that you. why thanks, yes yes but vinita also to go back to some of these other elements where you're talking about caring for instance what you're talking about is your children are looking at caring which is where you could perhaps look at the fink's taxonomy a bit better again the bloom's taxonomy really focuses a lot on being able to remember understand apply analyze evaluate create synthesize and create right that's where they are focusing on so these are very demonstrable activities of thinking processes that come through some of what you were talking about and what ajit and others were also talking about also deals with some of these other elements of how do you interact with others how do you uh, care about others how do you identify your own feelings and change uh, also the changes in those feelings how do you bring about those changes in those feelings and one of those elements that has to be done is that the student or the learner is basically also asked to reflect 
how did you feel about this earlier how did you feel about this today how would you think do you think you will feel about the same thing later on and a lot of what you're talking about and especially the montessori classroom training etc also talks about some of these elements of learning how to learn but also caring figuring out and being able to articulate and reflect on opinions kranti yes you had a point uh, if you could if everyone is welcome to talk but if you could keep it a bit concise it would be useful yes go ahead kranti good afternoon everybody madam i am a primary yes. school teacher ma'am yes hi kranti lovely to have you yes go ahead madam i always prefer to go with a holistic approach especially art integrated learning uh, i want to know you from you madam when i go with uh, art integrated especially drawing skills singing and dance when i integrate these things performance art and uh, as well as visual arts and the children from primary school involve a lot how far uh -huh. this is uh, uh, um, this is mentioned i mean at a significant level in nep madam uh, is this better interactive approach for a childhood i mean especially for primary children madam i want to know this from you ma'am <laughs> well i am not going to go into but i i do want to uh, just highlight i think uh, dr jayaraman has put in the points of where the scientific vocational thinking etc is coming in but there's definitely uh, art integrated sports integrated learning curriculum and i'm just highlighting these points to you all in the nep document uh, again where there is a cross curricular approach and pedagogy that comes in so definitely that is there it is embedded in the classroom today a lot of the foundational literacy nipun documents etc will also talk about toy based learning activities art based mm -hmm. learning activities and trying to get the students to express themselves in multiple ways and multiple modalities of representation is also a universal design principle which again the nep talks about mm -hmm. right so the point is uh, when we come back to frameworks and the reason i'm going back to these frameworks is that do we really uh, only look at the cognitive skills where Where we are only focusing on how much of knowledge building there is. Do we also look at how the effective skills are? Where we focus on uh, the elements and psychomotor skills that they may have. Do we also look at other elements that could be dealt with in terms of the cognitive and developmental knowledge? These are questions that I think Dr. Jairam also raised where he was asking, where do we? Uh, how is it that Gardner and multiple intelligences and Bloom's taxonomy is so prominent? And that's a question that a lot of us would have to try and answer when we talk about why is it that whenever we talk about these learning taxonomies and taxonomy of learning is one of the ways to organize information and learning experiences for us as we move towards. uh learning outcomes and the learning outcomes are very clear that we need to promote scientific thinking we need to promote empathy constitutional values we need to be getting them to be creative communicative critical thinkers we need to definitely give them the basic foundational literacy in some levels these are some of the elements that they definitely talk about but as we focus on all of this are there other times are there other mechanisms where we could be looking at in terms of trying to organize the information that we have so for instance one of the things that the bloom's taxonomy very often is uh, you know neglected and i'm just going to quickly sum up before i ask others uh, uh, you know and allow others to uh, also Ma chime in yes Ma yes go ahead kranti Sorry to interrupt you, Madam. Uh, I have been finding some progressive outcomes when uh, children uh, prepare some uh, clay models and draw some uh, pictures. They um, they express their views, their perceptions through these kind of art. Uh, I, I I want to know from you: uh, Is there any psychological, scientific found, uh, findings behind this approach? Okay, can we proceed with this approach, Madam? That's what my question here, Madam. for art based learning yeah yes ma'am yeah yeah there is a lot that is there and we can cite is you to those sources is it child, yeah. child friendly is it child friendly not only that yeah, are there any scientific psychological findings behind this approach okay uh, 
for that yeah yeah there are there's a lot of studies done in this field and one of the people that you could look at in terms of just trying to understand how to use art integrated teaching is jane sahi's book also which talks about using art and also the representation of art in textbooks etc so definitely all of those but there are also these gradu gradation drawings where we talk about them as students being able to move from um you know how they are expressing themselves in through lines etc it it requires more learning of art and psychology but yes there is quite a lot of teaching study. foreign language man especially for teaching a foreign language like english it helps me a lot madam in my classroom transaction sure and and the, that is multiple representation which in another session of school synergy on universal design principles have been spoken about that multiple modalities of representing information definitely also helps this goes back to gardner's multiple intelligences aspects but i just wanted to point out out here to certain elements that some of you have already spoken about with respect to intuition feelings etc this is the effective domain that bloom's taxonomy does spoke speak about but is very less uh, referenced in regular context most of the time we are very focused on the cognitive development in fact one of the points that was being is being made in the chat by aruna is that the brain is basically the focus has been a lot on the cognitive uh, learning that is there it is rather than only the cognitive skills but it's not bloom's taxonomy also talks of psychomotor skills and effective skills we we don't focus on it enough um so one element is of the fact that you're receiving information do you are you aware of new information that is being received are you are you uh, trying to uh, you know even recognize that information but also whether how do you respond to that information do you um, like that idea do you dislike the idea how do you feel about it this was one of the questions that some of you asked but also do you value some one thing over the other and this is a question that is always there in a lot of these other courses right so for instance in a children's if i take a children's story book one of the most uh, popular stories that comes in is a friend in need is a friend indeed you know this is like one of those moral sayings that comes in or we have always made students write on honesty is the best policy in school i mean all of us have all written essays on these right and so we are looking at it and saying that uh, whether there is a certain idea or material that we value do we are we able to defend it are we able to justify it now what makes it very interesting is to try and see whether there's a contrasting link so you should be honest but what if it hurts another's feelings should we be honest should we tell the lie should we hide the truth uh is hiding the truth telling a lie equal to telling a lie when we have these kinds of questions there is a kind of valuing that is happening uh class circle uh there is a valuing that is happening and that is some comes through in these elements it's also to go back to what arpana said that we may not always be consistent and we develop our consistency over a period of time about which are the values that we internalize another question that we have when we look at this is internalizing values which means that we are not born with values all the time we don't always have the same values as we grow up as we had earlier you know as we children see the world largely in black and white but as we grow up we are supposed to see them in multiple shades of gray so those kinds of elements of figuring out how we are discriminating between things how much of um awareness we have of differences how we revise and change and reflect and interpret also are kinds of elements that come in and this is more evident today with some of these elements that nep talks about where it says um we must uh you know focus on how students are to be learn learning but also how they must be able to have respect for diversity for the local context but also talk about the fact that there may be uh, you know continuous review that they are looking through in terms of uh, focusing on conceptual understanding uh, how they are trying to understand words like ethics and this human capital uh, you know respect for public property etc that comes in so these elements are there in when we are trying to get the students to learn from the 
I again, my question to you would be if you had a specific example. So let's take up a specific example. And you were asking about how do we teach this in the class? Um, I do want to point out that there is a difference between critical literacy and critical thinking. Critical literacy being that uh, you would want to do something. So you reason it out, but you also then move ahead and act to implement change for the betterment of society, for the betterment of yourself, for whatever reason, you would be able to move towards action. So critical literacy is actually being able to act for a solution, towards a solution. Critical thinking is just being able to reason. And uh, so it is a subset of critical literacy. It is not the whole, right? You are able to reason, but you may still not move towards action. You may be able to understand, but you may still not move towards action. So that's one of the elements. Now, to go back to profess, I mean, uh, when we are looking through this, I have a question. Um, say we want to teach students, and you were talking about this element of collaboration, uh, and this is happening even in terms of group discussions or anything, you know, you talk about it and say team spirit. Uh, this is a question that I have. Yes. Um, if we are trying to teach students to collaborate, which seems to be one of the goals of NUP, that they should learn how to be encouraging and, and have constitutional values and so on and so forth. How do we uh, then enable them to, how do we then evaluate them on any of these elements of collaboration or team spirit? Any, any kind of suggestions from you would be great. How could we evaluate them? What could we do? There are frameworks. There is a lot that we can do. This is one part. There are also other elements of uh, focus in terms of the psychomotor skill. Uh, but we'll come back to that. How could we enable them to uh, understand? How could we enable them to be to look at the fact whether they are whether there is a sense of team spirit in group discussions. So let's, let's keep it as simple as group discussions. So how can we evaluate this? I want to evaluate in group discussions how much of collaboration and team spirit there is. How could we do that? Shall I, ma'am? Sure, go ahead. Madam, uh... I have been practicing collab collaborative learning, uh, peer learning, as well as child to child, in, uh, child learning, madam. Uh, here, uh, little teacher aspect, a, a, a child from fifth class, if you are there, madam, uh, they teach the younger ones at home as well as at school for a period of time, 20 to 25 minutes, because there was a huge gap during pandemic period, madam, learning gap to bridge that gap. Uh, this was my approach. These people, I mean, these people from fifth class teach at uh, their uh, home also. Uh, from this, uh, what I could find, um, child to child, when it happens, child to child learning, uh, the younger children uh, were eager to know from their uh, sisters and brothers. That was really a progressive one, madam. Not only that, when they collaborate, uh, peer learning also fruitful uh, approach, madam, because they can share, they can interact freely. That was a really liberal platform from um, for them because before a teacher, all the children could not express freely. When they are in groups, when they are in uh, collaborative practices, they can share, they can involve, they can express um, their perceptions, whatever the uh, teaching concept. And that was also very um, fruitful. I have been practicing this for last two years. Uh, and I have so many evidences, madam, little teacher and collaborative learning. And not only this, madam, these uh, children from fifth class teach to first class children and, uh, every day for 20 to 25 minutes. After school hours, they teach. That is okay. Uh, along with this, I, I bring these fifth class children to Anganwadi Center, uh, pre-primary. There are uh, uh, three plus year uh, aged people are there, madam. Uh, students mm -hmm. are there. These children are so, also impressed by the, this uh, little teacher aspect, madam. Because I could uh, find this is a really child-friendly approach. Fair enough. Yes, ma'am. 
so it is basically students teaching other students they may be peers mm -hmm. or they may be uh, younger students but they are yes. trying to teach them mm -hmm. the same but that's that's a kind of thing where it is still a one way uh, it's a still a unidirectional mode where there is one student who is still the authority figure now instead of the teacher it is another student but it's still the authority figure teaching someone else i i don't know whether that teaches about collaboration and team spirit per se right in in terms of i don't know how that occurs but uh, again i'm willing to understand and learn but from the description you gave it's still one student who knows something channeling it on to the others uh, aruna you're right where you're looking at it and saying that uh, you know humans intuitively collaborate and so maybe excite the learners towards working on a problem and uh, there may be the uh, group discussion will bring up the alpha student is what professor jairam says but accepting everyone's ideas now this is the point you know most of the time when we talk about uh, uh, these challenges where we are saying accepting everyone's ideas um and what does it mean when i say accepting everyone's ideas is is it that we need to accept their ideas or is it that we need to know how to um appreciate the person whereas we may express disagreement with an idea uh you know these are this this part of it is where the collaboration and team spirit etc will have to come in if everyone has 15 ideas if there are 15 people in a group and everyone has a different idea ultimately the project cannot work and uh, i think uh, professor jaira i think there were different people who have been saying this in terms of project based learning or uh, as aruna was saying about collaborative uh, you know working towards a project this project project based learning again will not work if everyone has different ideas yes sorry someone had raised their hand and i forgot who it was arpana you have so go ahead Uh, ma'am i would like to make a point here mm -hmm. that uh, when students are working in a group they need to understand this that um, agree to disagree mm -hmm. politely i mean uh, everybody has their own point of view everybody has their own you know way of thinking and children when working in a group or having a group discussion even as a team they may come up with different points so uh, if each member in a team should you know uh, politely agree or if in case they disagree they should accept that also that needs to be uh, you know taught by the teacher before we start with the group discussion because i have experienced that sometimes within the team the, the team members they don't agree on certain points so i feel that you know coming to a common conclusion after having a nice polite discussion you know when the team members are disagreeing on something is what teacher needs to teach or maybe i don't know how it can be done but this is my thought about it as i have experienced in my class correct so uh, thank you arpana and that is the point you know when we are talking about the fact that there could be disagreement so one element that comes in through these is the ability for one person to say uh, you know i don't agree in principle but i think for the larger good of this group for now we can go with this kind of uh, you know point to be made please note that we are all having group discussion here not everyone is participating some people are being silent some people are typing into the uh, chat some are uh, you know responding both doing typing in the chat and uh, uh, you know speaking up and we in that sense how do we decide that the esteem spirit comes in from those angles of where where we want to go so typically most of the time when we talk of group discussions or when we are looking at these we talk about equal opportunities for all but even in this group discussion there hasn't been equal opportunity for all it's not always practical it is not even perhaps always desirable but the opportunity to to speak up may be there but maybe they don't get uh, and that that is available i mean all of you could have raised your hand could have put in the chat etc but uh, whether it actually gets implemented that everyone has a turn that's a problem where there are 66 of us right now the yeah, entire just, session so is supposed to be for 60 minutes yeah. i know Lugna, i was coming to the point 5 minutes more <laughs> yes, yeah okay. and also lubna had uh, raised, raised her, her hand. hand okay so now this comes in yes um 
Uh, Lubna, go ahead, maybe the last point, and then we come back to kind of trying to wind up. And I'll try and go back to answering uh, Professor Jairam's two questions that he had posed, yes. Okay, uh, just I want to make a point. Uh, collaboration also leads to making leaders also, because we need a leader also in that situation who can think clearly about uh, is the uh, group discussion or the activity is going in a right direction. So teacher, maybe uh, for in uh, in a group of younger children, teacher would play that role or in the uh, uh, teenager groups uh, of a student, uh, the uh, students can also take the part who become the leader, who can decide what should be. So, uh, that's yeah, the teacher could assign someone and then yes. take that in opportunity turns. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think anytime we go to a playground, especially in lower classes, we know that emergent leadership occurs naturally. There is always someone who tries to be the alpha, then there's someone else who fights the next one and becomes the alpha person. So yes, it is true that there could be that leadership as well. But my particular point to ask was, how do we then evaluate if we have to take something like group discussion, which actually occurs through many things. It occurs in a classroom engagement exercise. It occurs when we are doing project-based learning. It occurs when we have to try and um, you know get consensus going it is also something used right from childhood uh, from young school days to higher education and tertiary education uh, to a large extent uh, it is used as one of the gateways to getting jobs etc so i was wondering how we would judge and evaluate team spirit and how to go back and, and to frame some of the questions that i'm trying to go back to answer because i i'm conscious that i have five minutes only. But um, what Professor Jairam had asked were two questions. One, why is it that Gardner's philosophy and uh, the multiple intelligence and why Bloom's taxonomy gets so much of leeway? I did want to point out that even within Bloom's taxonomy, when we are focusing on Anderson and Prothol, to a large extent, we are still focusing a lot on cognitive. There were elements of effective and psychomotor where we have not really focused enough on. So psychomotor skills would be these um, elements such as where we are trying to understand perception. How are the how is the student observing, and then enabling them to try and understand. Uh, to be more and more observant. This is something that really helps scientific thinking, for instance. Uh, also trying to talk about the fact of how they could be uh, imitation. So the levels could be that they are just imitating something, but over a period of time, their proficiency grows, their confidence grows, and they're able to come up with a con complex response where they may be manipulating two or three other uh, skills and trying to focus on those um, adaptation where they're able to integrate other skills without guidance and they're also then able to originate and some of these psychomotor skills are exactly what is being focused upon in terms of apply and create which is the higher order thinking skills to a large extent. But we don't really focus a lot on these aspects of effective domains where we are talking about the fact that where we could be articulating, where we could try and see whether they are internally internalizing their elements. So these are elements that we could, we could possibly come back to and re revise our frameworks on. Um, uh, if you have ideas, sir, please do share. But uh, we were, yes, uh, assertive and aggressive, Roshni, to that extent, uh, there is this element that could come in where the body language, et cetera, comes through. Definitely, also their human dimension. So how are they trying to talk about? And then, Kranti, you're right. Uh, there could be this entire thing through collaboration that they could learn how to cooperate. But again, the reason I'm asking these questions and I'm, the reason I'm talking about the taxonomy and trying to talk about the backward design is that if I know that I want to enable them to focus on caring, one of the taxonomies of learning is that they must learn how to care for another's opinion. And then if I talk about caring, then it is about the question then comes in that most of the people come back with, did you accept your ideas? You know, and that is not the only goal of caring. Caring can mean that I disagree with you and I express that I respect your choice, but I don't agree with you. I'm not in agreement with what you're saying. So 
that notion, how we manage to teach them, especially from the primary, where we could say accept everyone's ideas is tolerance means accepting everyone's ideas. But as we grow up, we also are learning, and this is one of the constitutional values and scientific thinking that we will have to balance and weigh the values that we are raising. So does caring, if we are saying we care for others' opinions and we care for our own, does it mean that we have to accept our ideas or or does it mean that we need to give them tools to be able to disagree politely? And that's what Arpana was also talking about. So it may be that the taxonomies that we are going by are, to go back to uh, Dr. Jairam's questions, that there is not one taxonomy of learning that we could go by and then say, oh, this is going to map to the NEP framework. There could be many taxonomies, and I promise only one more minute, uh, Ruchi, but there could be many multiple taxonomies that you're trying to mold in and then try and say whether you want to focus on, say, think, for instance, the human dimension, or you want to look at the integration where you try and focus on the elements of connections between different perspectives, which multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity especially is something that things taxonomy really caters to. Uh, the social emotional learning skills of developing interests and also focusing on values that one must focus on, the constitutional values, et cetera, is something that things taxonomy also talks about and learning how to learn is also something that the NEP focuses and that the things taxonomy to a large extent focuses on. This does not mean that we must use the things taxonomy. That's not what I'm saying. And as I pointed out, the Bloom's taxonomy could also be something that has certain uh, you know, points to give us. It's that we, when we are trying to deal with this taxonomy of learning, and we focus on these elements, it could be that we try and gather and then figure out what works for us the best, knowing that there are these other elements that could be focused upon. As I said, there are multiple people who have been working on this for the last 50 years and more, and they have all been a lot focused on the cognitive domain, but there is this entire element which also talks of the effective domain, caring, learning, et cetera. Um, the psychomotor is also important from other elements of inclusivity. And so we still have a lot of work. This is just a snapshot of the kinds of learning and skills that could be there. And I will share all of these links in it. Uh, can be evaluated through team. Uh, yes, rubrics are definitely there, uh, Mithul and others. Uh, I wanted to give this as a case specific example to talk about how if my taxonomy of learning is about caring, caring does not have to mean accepting. You know, that definition need not be accepting. It just means respecting. So you may want to figure out the words that you use to evaluate. So when we talk of demonstrable learning outcomes, it may be that caring means respecting, not necessarily agreeing or accepting. That differences may have to be more firmly thought out as we go through NEP challenges. We are just touched the tip of the iceberg. There is a long way to go, but um, I'm very conscious that time is run out. It's 4-3 and Ruchi is, <laughs> yeah. So um, yes, Kranti and others, Mithun, yes, rubrics is really very important. But again, the point is what within the rubrics would you uh, bring in? As I said, the problem that I generally find with uh, team spirit is that people, First, say we must accept everyone's opinions. So those become problematic. The links that I am just shared, and I purposely was using links to show that this is all not my idea. I am also using other people's ideas. Uh, so these are the links that basically uh, I had been looking through. And the NEP, of course, is a, a link that you should be able to have, but I will still share the link. Yeah. Um, in the next session, perhaps if that occurs, the one thing that would be fascinating to see is how uh, learning, uh, you know, and how taxonomies, maybe the different taxonomy that you would want to build for your own learning, like taxonomies of learning are basically what you would want to highlight and prioritize in your learning. 
uh, objectives, you know, do you want the psychomotor or the effective or things and what would it be that you would want to do? So you could be the next Anderson and Prothol uh, in, in that sense and then try and see how this matches to the NEP outcomes to a large extent. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Anusha, for this uh, interactive session. And uh, I'm sure, I mean, uh, we all have learned a lot in terms of the diversity of the taxonomies and especially, uh, you know, including aspects like affective uh, uh, domain, uh, notion of caring, collaboration and psychomotor domain. And uh, I would just urge everyone to think about these different taxonomies that were shared by Anusha also. Uh, read up NEP and uh, you know the kind of suggestions that have been given and in the next session if uh, which is on the next Saturday uh, same time 3 p.m. Uh, maybe uh, you can come up with a certain kind of a lesson plan or an activity based on a uh, taxonomy and uh, especially uh, incorporating aspects of caring as uh, incorporating aspects to, uh, to address the effective dimension and the psychomotor dimension because i think cognitive dimension we all have tried a lot but uh, we definitely need to work on integrating effective and the psychomotor dimension so uh, i would really look forward to your ideas uh, next week and even if you have tried such ideas in your classrooms you can definitely share it in the next session on saturday uh, you can also share your idea on the telegram group uh, i hope all of you are there on the school synergy uh, teachers forum and anusha would also share the links that she has shared here uh, on the telegram group and you can also yeah. share your ideas there itself. You can discuss it. You can discuss the session also further uh, in the Telegram group. That is the purpose of creating it. So that, you know, the discussion is not just limited to uh, this uh, live discussion that we are having here. And if something strikes you later on, or there are so many points that people want to share uh, from their classroom, so they can continue sharing it on the Telegram itself. Uh, please do fill up the telegram, uh, this uh, feedback form that I have shared on the chat. I'm going to put it again now in the chat itself for everyone. Yeah. So uh, I will just now share the link for, to join the Telegram group itself. Uh, you just need to download a Telegram app on your mobile and then you can uh, click on this link and you can join it. Okay. If you have any other points, anybody has any other points you can, uh, or questions, you can please share. I'll just meanwhile uh, put the link of the Telegram group. Anusha, uh, if nobody uh, is uh, sharing any point, can you just give them certain ideas about uh, what kind of things they can think about uh, for the next session? part two of the session next Saturday. Yeah, so I actually just went ahead and uh, was writing out what you said, that they could share uh, more than the taxonomies, they could think about the effective and psychomotor skills, but also what of this, I mean, obviously when we talk of multiple intelligences, for instance, we are looking at kinesthetic and motor skills, et cetera. Bloom's taxonomy and the multiple intelligence is actually still thinking about how we process information, how we receive information uh, and how we process it. So it's a lot in terms of the cognitive domain. And that is one of the easiest to demonstrate, actually. And as very vehicle, we're talking about motivation, gut feelings. That's one of the more difficult ones to articulate and challenge. So when we are talking of values, when we talk of uh, enabling them to how understand how they are learning and how to reason it how would you track if to give you a very simple conceptual mapping if you had to grade a student in just a rubric of uh, beginner intermediate and advanced in your class right now and you want to talk about whether they are critical thinkers and this was one of the challenges that Arpana and others had pointed out. So critical thinkers, are they beginner critical thinkers, intermediate critical thinkers or advanced critical thinkers for their age level in second standard or seventh standard or 12th standard? 
how and what would be the measurable de demonstrations that you may want to identify? How would you want to think about it? That would be one of the ways that you can actually articulate. And when you sit down to map it, it is such a challenge because we all sit here and we are trying to evaluate students and we are saying, are they really critically thinking about this reading? And, uh, you know, what is it that shows us that there is a criticality in their thought? There is a you know, or if they are doing a group discussion, how do we know that they are, they have team spirit? Do they always give chance to others at the expense of themselves? Then sometimes that means they are almost, uh, you know, negating themselves. Is that a good trait to have? Is that something that I should not get them to also assert themselves that you are also part of the team? How do I teach that? So these are these become very important ideas. And in today's time, and for the vocational skills that Dr. Jairam also spoke about, as we are skilling people, these, uh, as a, these um, aptitudes and skills become very important for us to also focus on. So if you could think about some of these, I hope that helps uh, trigger ideas, not if nothing else. Thanks a lot, Anusha. So uh, I think uh, we have had a very interesting session for us to build upon uh, next week. I look forward to having all of you again uh, join us next week on uh, 3 p.m. And uh, we will discuss this further, build on it, and maybe design something new that can be used in the classroom. OK, so until then, uh, bye. We'll see you again next week. Please do fill up the feedback form if you have not. Thank you. Bye.